I'm going to be demonstrating to you how I cast the um, cups and mugs that I make with porcelain casting slip. I like slip casting because it's quite precise. Before I came back to university, I did, studied engineering and then I got back into arts and crafts by going and doing sculpture and stone carving. Um, and slip casting enables me to combine all of those things really well. This is the slip and I make this from bags of porcelain which I mix with water and add a deflocculating agent and what that does is make sure that the particles of clay don't all go back to wanting to hug each other anymore, they stay separate. Um, and what's really important about casting slip is that it's very liquid um, and you need to be able to have it run like that off your fingers and ideally to make little duck's feet in between your fingers, then you kind of know intuitively it's about the right thickness. If it doesn't do that, if it drops like it is now, it's probably too thick. If slip is too thick, you don't get a good cast with it and you can't really use it. So I've made up this slip. I'm gonna pour it into the mold and then I'm gonna show you and tell you about how I made that mold and how I designed it from scratch. So it's very important to have enough slip in your jug to do the full cast, otherwise you get a nasty little line around the cast and you can't ever, ever get rid of that. So I'm just going to pour it in, up to the top, and slightly above the top. Because what happens in the mould is the plaster takes the water from the clay to make it solid and so this goes down, so you need to top it up during the course of the process. Whilst these are casting, I'll talk to you about how I came up with the design for these. So basically, in my sketchbook, I had to draw about 50, 60 different ideas for cups. So I started um, just looking, different designs, very simple sketches on how to do them thought about them, thought, well, why am I trying to make a cup? Well, I want to drink coffee, so it needs to be a certain size. But I basically wanted a long, straight cup because where I was living, all the trees were that shape, the other way up. They were kind of that shape, and I wanted to pick that up. So I then thought, well, how big is a standard cup of coffee? So I found that out from the internet, and I started to do scale drawings um, of the cup of coffee. So this is roughly the shape I wanted and I had to work out what the volume was. Happily you can get that off Google and the internet now, you don't have to be a maths wizard. So I worked out how big it needed to be and whether that would contain the volume of coffee I wanted. And then I had to do some full scale drawings. And so these are accurate to the size that I wanted it to be, um, drawings of the cup. So that's the basic cup with the wall thickness that I wanted and this is um, the cup to make the plaster master that I was going to cast from. Okay. So I know how big that is and I know I want that shape so I then cut a template out of metal that was of this profile. So you then have to make that from plaster on a, a a spinning wheel, which is a bit like uh, rubbing your tummy, patting your head and trying to do a dance at the same time. There's so much happening because you work with really soft plaster. Um, and I turned from a big cylinder of plaster using a metal um, shape, I turned this plaster master. Now, you keep this forever and you can make as many moulds from it as you can. Okay, so this should be about the same size as this drawing. Okay. Once you've got the plaster master, then I've covered this in a substance called shellac, which makes it um, you, means that you can't get water through it. Um, so that's why this one's brown. And then I soaked it with mold maker size so that it resists water again. And then I, um, I, I made um, a barrier around it, which is called a cockle, so that I could then pour plaster over this and get a mould from it, 
which is what I'm casting in here. So on small scale, it would have been a plaster mold over this that gives you just a very simple dropout mold. Okay. Once you've got your mold, you just let it dry because it needs to be dry to absorb moisture from it. And um, when it's dry, you can do what we started on, which was putting the, pouring the slip um, into the mold. This one is um, just gently forming a skin around the edge of the cup. I don't know whether you can see that. There's a very thin, solid line appearing around the edge there when I do that one. This one's further along in the process, so it's a bit thick. You basically have to work out how long to leave the slip in the mold by a process of trial and error. Now I know from experience of using these with a different kind of clay um, that it was going to be somewhere around 15 minutes. What I found with porcelain is it has to be about 17 minutes, otherwise it's really too thin. So this one has been in here for the desired time and I don't know whether you can see but there's actually um, a little wet ring. Can you see the difference in colour mm -hmm. yeah. around here? And that's where the water has been absorbed from the porcelain and into the plaster. So I'm going to pick this up now and tip it out into the jug. And hold it upside down for a little while, exercising my arm muscles. Whilst most of the liquid porcelain slip comes out. It's actually important the angle that you hold it at as well. Um, at this point I really don't want to turn it back up the right way because the porcelain will run back down the inside of the cup and then you'll get nasty little dribbles mm -hmm. on the inside of the cup and people don't normally want to drink out of things like that. So it's just about finished dripping so I'm now going to leave this here and that will be there for about five minutes, just while the rest of the um, porcelain drips out. And I want it to get to the point that when I pick it up and have a look inside it, it's no longer shiny. Mm -hmm. If I showed you the inside of that one now, it would be shiny. And then if I turn it up like that to trim the edge, again, I'll get those dribbles that go back down the inside and make for an ugly drinking vessel. So that one stays there like that, and then I will trim away the excess porcelain. So in true blue Peter fashion, I have two that I made earlier, okay? So in this mold, I have one of these cups, and this has been in here for hmm, probably about an hour now. It wouldn't have needed to be in here for that long, actually. And you can see where I've trimmed it, it's come away from the sides of the cup. So fingers crossed, when I put a thing on here and turn it upside down, without saying the magic words, it should just come out and that reveals the little um, greenware porcelain shop cup that I've got. And as you can see, it's quite a lot larger than the finished item and that's because it shrinks so much in the firing. So I'm going to leave that one now to dry out quite a lot. It's still very wet and if I pick it up now, I'm gonna make a dent in it, which I don't want to do. So I'm gonna put it down and show you one that I made yesterday. So it's the same. It's actually a slightly different mold. But it's the same as that, but there's a big difference in color. So that's the very wet one and this is dry. And then what I would need to do before I can fire that, the edge of that, you can see where I've trimmed it with the knife. And you're not gonna to want to drink from that, are you? So I would normally um, polish that in water, sand it down a bit, and then I get a sponge. 
um, and I love these sponges on sticks because you can get on the inside and around the outside. So I'll get a sponge and I will sponge away. It's something I do before this stage actually. But ultimately I end up sponging the edges so that they feel nice in your mouth. If it doesn't feel nice in your mouth, you're never going to want to use it. That piece then can go in the kiln tomorrow and I can put it through the first firing and I will fire it to a temperature of about 1000 degrees C and that's called a bisque fire. I will then take it out and glaze it with just a transparent glaze um, and this is, um, it's not the same, this is a bisque fired pot. This is the raw clay, and the bisque fired pot, I don't know whether you can see, it's slightly pinker. This one, it's about the same size, but this one's pinker, and when I'm touching them, it's a lot lighter, because all the water's gone from it. So I take those and I glaze them, um, and I spray a transparent glaze onto them, make sure their bottoms are very clean so it doesn't stick to the kiln shelf, and I put it in the kiln, and then I fire them back to... 1260 degrees, so 1260 degrees, which is about the temperature for porcelain. You can fire it higher than that, but if you fire it lower than that, you don't get the nice um, luminous qualities of it. Okay, so that's the whole process, and this shows you how much smaller they get, which still surprises me. So, um, this one may nearly be may nearly be ready to trim now. It's slightly shiny on the edge, but I will do it anyway. I use a knife with a very thin blade. This isn't a potter's knife at all. This is a knife that I got in a second-hand shop in Finland, but I got it because it's got such a thin blade and you want a flat, thin blade. And I always do it on a turning circle because it's round and I put it flat against the mould and then I pull this excess away. It's gone a bit dry. So I pull this away, turning, and I'm always cutting away from the mould because any little bits that fall into it mess up your pot completely. Um, so I just do this and I cut away and I'm just trimming it to get a nice flat edge as we go around. You have to be careful doing this because sometimes you can drag it away from the edge of the mould and then you get a cup with a flat side. So there we go. And then that one just goes to one side and gets left until it's dry. And if you can pass me that mould, you can feel how heavy it is. <laughs> so again, this is one of the bigger cups that's been in there for a while. I'm just looking for a piece to put it on. This one also should turn out. I looked at an awful lot of bare branches and snow when I lived in Finland <laughs> and those patterns kind of went in my head so I have some coloured mm -hmm. slip in a slip trailer here and I put it in the mould first so I just make each one is unique because, as you can see, it's fairly random mark making. I do that. And another little trade secret is to put a piece of wire back down inside your slip trailer so it doesn't bung up because it's a while in between. Um, so that's in there like that. And then I let it dry slightly. Um, and then I just pour in the white porcelain. So that is a technique that I've developed during the course of my final year here at Glinda 